Dr. Carrie Tiffany was born in West Yorkshire, but grew up in Western Australia. The Australian bush has had a big impact on her work as a writer. Her book, Mateship with Birds, won the Stella Prize, celebrating women's writing. Dr. Tiffany is in conversation with Poo Kong Key, the immediate past BHP Chair of Australian Studies at Peking University and Emeritus Professor at the University of Melbourne. The Foundation for Australian Studies in China acknowledges the traditional owners of the unceded land on which this interview was conducted. Your family migrated from Yorkshire in England to Perth in Western Australia in the early 1970s when you were six years old. After schooling and university in Perth, you became a park ranger in the Northern Territory. This was followed by a successful career as an agriculture journalist and a creative writer. Can you share with us the story of our Carrie Tiffany? Thank you, Pu Kong, and thank you for inviting me to contribute to this series um, of lectures, uh, conversations. It's lovely to be um, with such a fabulous group of peers and friends of Australian writers who are also contributing. Uh, it's difficult to... Um, I think maybe you're a novelist because you shy away from your own story and uh, you want to uh, embellish or embroider it um, and invent other possibilities, other possible lives for yourself. Um, and I certainly have no interest, in, no interest in sort of writing a memoir or a biography. But uh, I, I also teach writing and I do um, encourage my students to reach into their lives, their histories and their memories uh, for their own work. Um, and I would say that as a writer even of fiction, that what we're involved with is, is truth, is trying to reveal some truth and that you may choose a novel as the way to the best way to express that particular truth. And my novels do contain elements of my migration story. So, and my parents from very ordinary uh, part of West Yorkshire um, and uh, uh, certainly, you know, had minimal schooling and had, there's no university in my family until me. Um, that's one of the things that migration gave me. Um, but it was, you know, a radical thing to, to go from uh, the UK in the early 1970s to go to Perth, Western Australia. Um, and we arrived in the summer. Uh, uh, we arrived in February and I think it was sort of 40 degrees every day. And I was astonished at everything that I saw. Um, I, I really felt that we were on another planet, that these two places couldn't really exist, you know, at the same time. My Yorkshire grandmother sort of had an idea that the Australian sun was very different to the English sun, you know, and I know scientifically that's illogical, but actually she's sort of right. Um, you know, there was something about the way the light hit the land and hit us on the land in our whiteness um, that felt so other and so strange um, and so threatening, actually. Much of it felt very threatening to me, and I think that... I wasn't astonished in a way that was kind of um, lush or sentimental. I think a lot of the time I was alarmed. I was sort of frightened uh, by, by the landscape and by the place that we found ourselves in. And also the, the isolation. And even though we lived amongst people on a housing estate kind of like us, people from Scotland and Ireland and England who'd come as part of, you know, that sort of 10-pound POM post-war white Australia migration scheme. Um, we also were completely cut off, you know, from grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins from all families. So um, we, we were very, uh, there were just four of us, my brother, my mother, my father, and we were, yeah, very isolated and um, it was quite sort of lonely and, and, yeah, very, very strange, I remember. I was, um, you know, hoping that uh, you could also share with us your rather unusual, I think, uh, a career of uh, being being a young woman park ranger in the Northern Territory. Uh, well, I was 
very interested in school in Western Australia about this notion of the bush. And even though we lived in an urban setting, a suburban setting, um, and we never went on holidays, we didn't actually go to the bush, much of uh, the mythology, uh, the cultural mythology at that time was really about the bush. You know, all of the projects we did in school were about mining or farming or the outback. You know, we, we read Banjo Patterson, The Man from Snowy River. We had um, a, photo, a, a big roll down landscape portrait um, in, that would roll down in front of the chalkboard at the front of the school. And it was a very famous painting by Tom Roberts, the Australian landscape painter, called Shearing the Rams. So the whole mythology, you know, we would sing Click Go the Shears, which is a shearing song um, once a week at assembly. So the whole mythology was very much about the bush. And the other thing that was very striking for me um, as a child when we, we moved to Western Australia was that outside the front of our house, there was this little strip of land, which in Australia we called the nature strip. We didn't have this at all in the UK. We lived, you know, in a sort of council house which fronted right onto the street. And I was really struck as a child by the idea that um, this new country had so much space in it that everybody got this strip of land out the front of their house. And also I would stand on it as a child and it wasn't much, it was just a bit of grass and a scraggly sort of gum tree, but I would look up this nature strip to all the other nature strips in the street and I would look down and I would think, oh, they lead somewhere. And the idea that I had was that they led to the bush, that they threaded into the suburbs in some way and they led to this place called the bush. So I was interested in going to the bush and going to the outback and, um, and really spending some time there to, to see what it was. It po possibly sounds a bit more adventurous on paper than it really was. It was also a little accidental, a sort of running away, you know, young person running away from things, uh, running away from inability to complete or fit in at university. Um, and... Uh, you know, I, I went there initially to work as a housemaid in one of the hotels. You know, I just saw a job advertised in the paper. And I was very fortunate that at the time they arrived, um, we were just starting to speak about joint management with the Aboriginal community um, at Ayers Rock, the Anangu people. And uh, they were keen to employ a female ranger to um, develop programs with um, some of the Anangu women. And I just sort of happened to be there in the right place at the right time. So it was a sort of strange accident, um, but one that was uh, really important to me. I spent sort of about four years um, in the centre uh, at Uluru, and then I also worked at other parks and reserves in the Northern Territory uh, as well. And I worked also in, uh, in Victoria, when I moved to Victoria, as a park ranger um, in a central highlands forest, in a sort of forestry situation as well. That's a childhood fascination with the bush, in a way, explains your subsequent choice of a career uh, by being an agriculture farm journalist. Yeah, there's some questions for me that I think... Um, really filter also into my first novel, which is a novel about farming, really, about uh, scientific farming in the interwar years in Australia in the 1930s, um, that kind of came out of some of my landscape experiences. So I had a sort of experience working on regenerative burning with some of the Anangu people, and uh, I had a sense that there was a different way of being on that landscape for them, that there was a way of being on the landscape which was in the landscape. And when um, I, I moved to Victoria and I started talking to farmers, I was working with farmers on management plans about salinity and land degradation problems. And there's an expression in Australia that um, farmers use, which is we're on the land. That's a way of saying you're a farmer. You would say, I'm on the land. My family's on the land. Uh, and those two ideas, this in the land and on the land, really interested me. And I, I thought there was other sort of um, 
Other artists that I was interested in were also looking at those questions. There's some really interesting paintings by the Australian painter Sidney Nolan um, called the Wimmera series. And I was working quite a lot in the Wimmera and the Mallee areas of Victoria, very dry landscapes. Uh, and Nolan spent some time there. He was stationed, um, he was stationed at, at these strange sheds uh, during the war, which were full of food, like cans of spam and baked beans, over concern that Japan might have invade Australia. And his job was to guard these sheds full of spam. But it was the first time as a painter he'd had he'd really looked at that landscape and been in it. And I felt that in his canvases he was also dealing with this idea of kind of in and on the landscape and that's been a really central question for for my writing I think a really sort of un underpinning question. You have uh, lived in different parts of uh, the continent of uh, Australia growing up in Western Australia worked as a ranger in the Northern Territory and then as a journalist and writer um, spending quite a bit of time in Victoria. What are your impressions of um, regional differences uh, among the different states and the territory? It's interesting. Um, it's something I haven't thought a great deal about. I suppose um, I have that sort of slight outsider thing that most writers do. So. I'm not really ever attempting when I go somewhere to try to be an insider, but more just to um, be able to kind of watch and witness and observe um, things. But in fact, my some of my family is still in Western Australia, in Perth, and I was there recently, just a few weeks ago, visiting. And um, there is such a, a resentment in Western Australia really about the rest of Australia, about the eastern states, which was certainly alive very much when I was growing up and I had Australian friends at school. There was great suspicion um, about these kind of pretentious, sophisticated people from the eastern states and a horror of them, really. Um, and it was interesting to see that it was still very much in place. Um, but I, what I think about that is from my travels, you know, in other places in the world, you know, I spent a bit of time in Canada, I spent, I've spent a year in Berlin a few years ago, that these things are actually part of um, just the sort of human psyche, wherever you are, that um, the place you are, you have to justify to yourself is the place. And therefore, you have to other places which are not the place. Um, so despite often in Australia, pretty hellish climates and difficult conditions, the people that live there still, you know, love those places and have a sense of connection and a sense of home with them. Um, I think also I'm really interested in sort of regional writing uh, or writers that we consider regional. I think there's some really interesting uh, writers from Western Australia, particularly, that I'm kind of fascinated by. Um, I read my first Elizabeth Jolly novel when I was about 16, um, and I think it was possibly her first novel, actually, that she'd just published because she started publishing uh, later in her life. Um, and she actually had a little farm, a little piece of land not far from where um, I, I grew up in Western Australia. So that sort of fascinated me that they were people kind of writing those landscapes as well. Um, and then more recently, you know, really interesting uh, Aboriginal writers like Kim Scott as well um, uh, from Western Australia. But, you know, I'm still reading and rereading Elizabeth Jolly. Um, of course, Tim Winton is the West Australian writer and uh, Gail Jones um, hails from Western Australia. Um, so it's a great kind of literary tradition, I think, in Western Australia. And in the Northern Territory, I, I read quite a lot of Xavier Herbert, who spent some time kind of in the, in the outback um, and was really sort of interested in, in his ideas and impressions, even though that was sort of some, from some quite some time ago. He had a sensitivity, um, you know, you have to read him aware of the time in which he's writing, but he did have a, a sensitivity to the landscape and um, to Aboriginal culture, to um, 
yeah, to, to, to that history and that place that interested me. Several themes feature significantly in your writing. They include personal, family and cultural displacement, the land, environment and farms. And you also described just now the Australian landscape. You have also been interested in how humans relate to the animal world. Can you please tell us more about uh, those themes, fascinating themes? Mm. Well, I think, I think, you know, we are intrinsically, um, you know, interested in the, you know, we are animals, we are interested in the animal world and we're interested, oh, I certainly always have been in those divisions between us and them. And, uh, you know, from really early on, I remember, you know, being, you know, quite young in Western Australia and I remember ripping uh, bits of blanket off my bed and climbing up these trees with my brother's hockey stick with the bits of blanket tied around the edge to put them in the nests of birds because I was concerned about these birds, that they were cold in the winter and that they weren't going to make it through the winter. So, you know, what do you think about that? Well, it's, it's a very sentimental action of a child and possibly not an unusual action um, from, from a child, possibly also a kind of child who is a bit lonely and who is uh, doesn't have an extended family herself, you know, who has busy and distracted parents. And, in fact, my the relationship between my parents ended not long after we moved to Australia anyway. So that was, we, we were really even more isolated. Um, so that sense that you can observe in the animal world things like um, a family of birds making their family year after year after year through all those different ornithological processes of nesting and molting and... Um, um, nuptial behaviours, courting behaviours, the raising of young, um, all of the kind of wars uh, in in the bird world, um, and all of also all of those demonstrations that uh, appear very much like tenderness between um, between birds and other animals as well. With certainly things that I noticed a great deal and have always noticed. There was also in Australia. Something that sort of died, unfortunately, I think in, in sort of late 70s and early 80s was um, we had some nature writers um, and even a few TV personalities that um, weren't afraid to talk about the landscape in, in um, more nostalgic and um, sentimental and human-centric language. So we would have people who would use um, the, the pronouns he and she, you know, for, for birds or for different animals rather than um, the, the more distant pronouns. And that interested me. It seemed to me that language was one of the ways that you make divisions between the human and animal world and that by changing that language, you could bring that world into your family in some way, or you could distance it, you could make those choices. And I also, even though I'm a conservationist and I've worked as a park ranger and I'm still working in the environmental movement in Australia, in land care, I'm wary of this the scientific rhetoric around um, conservation and around how we relate to plants and animals, also how we relate to the soil and to water and, you know, to all, all the different kind of elements of life. Um, and I think that the language we use for them is really important and that science can reduce those relationships in ways that when we make decisions that harm those things, it um, makes it easier really to make those decisions because we're not emotionally involved. Um, so my writing, I think I want to demonstrate the depth of those relationships, um, how they, they, you know, I, I'm someone who would say I have no, no fear of being um, 
anthropomorphic. You know, that's now thrown around if you're being anthropomorphic as being a negative thing. Well, I actually think it's a really positive thing because um, unless you extend these ideas um, about feeling into the rest of the world, you know, how do you sort of really understand it unless you engage yourself? So my writing is very much about that and all of my um, my three novels, particularly the first two, um, heavily engage with ideas about the relationships between people and animals. Um, and these are, you know, animals including just pets and farm dogs. Um, in, in my work as an agricultural journalist, I would travel around Victoria and I would meet these very gruff farmers, you know, very um, pragmatic and uh, quite what you would think as quite hard men. And I would see them display the most tremendous tenderness and affection towards their farm dogs, you know. And that really interested me, that relationship. And also that they were often embarrassed about being so tender and affectionate in front of me with these dogs. And yet they clearly really, really loved these dogs very much. Um, so those, those, that um, also, you know, one of my novels has a family of kookaburras that um, feature very importantly as a kind of allegorical study of family relations. Um, so there's a sort of thread in the novel which is a human family and what happens with the human family over the course of a year or seasons um, and also the relationship between uh, a family of kookaburras um, as well. So this is a mixture of kind of scientific research that I'm doing to inform the writing, but also just of sort of my own personal observations of, um, you know, things that I see in the landscape around me. Uh, and also I, I did um, uh, this, the, the novel Matchup with Birds uh, concerns a dairy farmer and I spent some time on a number of dairy farms watching how uh, dairy farmers interacted with their cows um, and was really sort of interested in those relationships and how I could um, portray the rituals, the physical rituals in the body um, of the farmer and the body of the animals at the same time. Make sure to watch part two of our conversation with Dr. Carrie Tiffany and our full collection of interviews with some of Australia's leading authors.